You're looking at a man that, that spent three years and five months and 26 days and seven hours and 15 minutes and three seconds and never made PFC. <laughs> so keep the questions kind of simple. Can I, does anyone else? Don't be afraid to ask any questions. Jake, would you relate your memory of jumping into uh, Normandy on June 5th? What I thought was interesting, I'll let Jake tell it, I, I had an original invasion currency and I asked Jake, I said, would you sign us and put June uh, 6th D-Day? And he said, well, I'll put June 5th on it because that was my D-Day when he jumped in. So would you care to relate anything about that? Uh, they they had terrible weather. Storms <coughs> arose. They they intended to make the invasion on June 5th. But uh, due to weather conditions and all that, they had to delay it till June 6th. Before they make a major invasion or mission of any kind, the officers will all get together with all the information that they can attain, and they'll look over the situation and see how much it's worth and how much it will cost, what the loss will be. And they arrive at what they contend to be or expect to be a reasonable estimated loss, acceptable loss. And they thought on Normandy that they would lose 50% of paratroopers. They didn't make any bones about it. They told us before we loaded on the planes on June the 5th to shake hands with the guy next to you and said, you or him one won't be alive when the sun comes up. We actually lost 70%. But when we jumped in at midnight or a little before on June the 5th, they hit the beaches the next morning from 7 to 8 o'clock on up through noon, you know, with a different unit. So we jumped in and we had secured and the, the, the drop was terrible from the standpoint that all the pilots that were taking us in and the C-47s had, most of them had never made a night drop before. And they were a little skittish and this and that. And we hit terrific ground fire from the time we crossed the Canary and Jer Jersey Islands. Well, we got lots of lots of gunfire. Lots of planes were going down or burning up, and the pilots became confused, and they dropped us over a 50-mile area instead of an eight-mile area. But it worked out to our advantage because it scattered us over such a great area they didn't know where to defeat us or how to attack us. So it, it worked out well on that. But D-Day for us was June the 5th, and the first prisoners that we took to question and interrogate and find out the things we wanted to know. And one of the first things they'd say is they'd say, why didn't you come in last night like you were supposed to? <laughs> Their intelligence knew exactly when we were coming and where we were coming and the units involved. Any other questions? Raise your hand if you want to. I don't be afraid to ask. Golden opportunity. Jake, I asked you to tell the guys down there because we were over at your house one evening about um, there's so much politically correct stuff now about what you should do and what you can't do. You kind of touched on it a little bit ago, but you talked about the uh, atrocities and things. And Would you just address that because I think that's really important for people to understand that. The, uh, the paratroop units had a terrible name with the world. They called us the big pocket butchers. The, the battered bastards of Bastogne and things like that. Uh, we did not take prisoners. When, as I was explaining to y'all a minute ago, they had been occupied for three and a half, four years. So you never knew what side the civilian was on. So everything you, that was between you and your objective, you eliminated it. Whether it was women, children, or old men, or, or what it was because the success of you taking that objective that was assigned to you might mean saving the lives of a hundred other paratroopers to your right or left because you were occupying what you were supposed to. Uh, I never saw an American unit, I saw individuals, a few of them, commit atrocities, but I never saw an American unit commit an atrocity of war under the official supervision of officers. We did not. We did not take prisoners, paratroopers didn't. But we didn't for the simple reason that it's impossible. When you strike a group of crowds, and maybe 25 or 30 of them, you may kill 20 to 25 of them and five of them surrender. What are you going to do with them? You're behind lines. 
you're fighting guerrilla warfare. You're surrounded completely by Germans. You don't even have food for yourself. What are you going to feed those fun? How are you going to get an hour's sleep if, if there is a law? With well, those five of those live crowds that are waiting to holler and scream at the vulture position. So we did not take prisoners. We took them long enough to question and get any information to them. After a firefight and a battle, we would come back through there and we killed everyone that was wounded or hiding or playing dead. But this was necessary. It wasn't something. It wasn't our choice. It wasn't that we were any more ruthless than anyone else. Eleanor Roosevelt, at the end of the war, she was, Franklin had already died. She was swinging a pretty heavy stick up there. She had a lot of influence. And they decided that they would rotate the soldiers back home according to the number of points they had. You got so much for, for being a paratrooper, you got so much for combat, you got so much for each medal, and so forth. When you got a number of points, they would bring you right back to the States and discharge you. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt went to Congress and went to uh, the Pentagon and said that they could not afford to bring back paratroopers and turn them loose with society. All murderers and killers, people, and people. So what they need to do is set up rehabilitation camps and run them back through it and get them ready for for civil life again. Uh, they wouldn't accept that they didn't do it. They let the paratroopers out on a regular basis, just like everybody else. Uh, they all. Uh, most of the paratroopers that came back, to my knowledge, that I knew and kept track of, became very successful citizens. A lot of them fly their own jet planes to our reunion. Uh, one boy retired, Max Majewski retired, and sold his business for 12 million bucks, 10 million bucks, and went down. He was going to retire and go to Greece. And he went down and asked for his passports and visas and made application. And they told him they couldn't honor it, you know, they couldn't give it to him because he was an American citizen. He said, what do you mean I'm not an American citizen? He said, I went to school here, went to your college, said I was fought a war for you. He said, I paid you millions of dollars in income <coughs> tax. And he says, um, he had been married four times. He says, I've married half of the women in Southern California. He said, why am I not an American citizen? And they told him that his mother and father were immigrants here and were accused of a mining operation. He said he was an engineer down in Mexico. And Max was born down there. And when they came back to the States, they and his mother never did naturalize. But she didn't think about it. She just figured he was a baby. But uh, Max, uh, Max kind of turned out bad. And he's the only one that did that I know of. Uh, we had one that came back and was elected to Congress out in Oregon. And he became an attorney, and he came in just when they were discovering uranium and all that stuff. And he wrote nearly all the uranium and mineral rights and laws in California and Oregon. And when he died, he had a corporation of attorneys. He had 12 attorneys working for him. Another boy went in air conditioning and duty, and he flies his own jet plane charges because most of them married one time and raised anywhere from two to five children and educated all of them college level. So paratroopers did come back and make acceptable citizens. Yes, sir. What originally interested you in the paratroops? Uh, You've heard of the great American aviator Wally Post, you know, who killed with, with Will Rogers from right over in this section of the country. He grew up in the same town, town I did. When I was a little kid, I saw him make several parachute jumps out of my father's cotton pad. And paratrooping always appealed to me. Parachuting did. And then when the war came along, I thought that would be the kind of war I would like to fight because it's man to man, hand to hand. You know, you can be in an army unit, say an artillery unit or something like that, and you're sitting here in a gun position firing and they may kill you from eight or nine miles out. And you have no control over it. Or they, they may gas you if you get up next to the front line. They may use chemical warfare on you. They can't do this to paratroopers because you're in with them. And it's just man to man, eyeball to eyeball fighting. And 
you can, if you determine that you think that you're as good a man physically as anyone else, why well, it's, it's a good way to fight the war. Of course, the uh, extra jump pay probably was a nice incentive, extra too. Extra jump pay is very really good. <laughs> right. Do you know what our salary was in 42? What we went in at? $21 a month. Mm -hmm. That was our pay when we went in. <coughs> First, by being in parachute units, well, that gave you an extra $50 a month. And then most of our time was in front lines or in combat, which gave you extra hazardous duty pay or something like that. We were making more money than most of the officers. We weren't using it very wisely. I had, I had quite a bit of money nearly all my life. And I spent most of it on women and whiskey and the rest of it I just wanted. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, what do you think about the press exaggerating wars? Was it that the same way during World War II as it is now? The what is the press exaggerating things and being very biased? Uh, the, the most terrible thing that I think that has happened in Iraq is them bedding down reporters with the soldiers right on the field because who would like to be seen taking a gun and bayoneting or killing a child? Which you have to do a case. Uh, the press has made a terrible mistake in this war by bedding down with the combat people, I think. But in World War II, we didn't have any of that. They had to take the releases that they got straight from the military people. So it was, uh, uh, it was, we, we had that advantage over what we're doing now. Weren't there some exceptions with guys like Ernie Pyle? Uh, Ernie, Ernie did some traveling along with the group, yeah. But Ernie, Ernie was a good reporter. He just reported facts. Right. He, he was a great reporter. There's nothing to be ashamed about in war. War is hell just by the nature of it. Uh, you can make it a very enjoyable and fun thing with the right mindset. You have to take the idea and the attitude that there's no tomorrow, and you take advantage of every opportunity that you have to enjoy. And that way, well, you can get through it in pretty good shape. Okay, I know y'all got to get busy killing them crowds. <laughs> get with it. Thank Let's you. Give them a hand. Yeah. Thank you.